Chapter 4 Ernest Baker and Joseph Campbell Men's Tragic Destiny and the Importance of the Unconscious Now, that Jung's definition, which are relevant for the discussion throughout this book, have been ex examined, and now that it has been discussed, what the black book and the red book black books and the red book are and how important they were in the development of Jung's theories. It is important to answer another question first before continuing with the content of the black books and the red book. Essentially, the black books from the documentation of everything that was going on within Jung's unconscious at the time. For Jung, this turned out to be of extreme significance because it would be the source of his most important ideas. As discussed in Chapter 2, from the perspective of the individual, the integration of one's unconscious can be extremely important. However, why then would Jung's specific individual experiences of the exploration of his own unconscious be of interest to anyone who is not attempting to develop psychological theories? In order to answer this question, I would like to incorporate the ideas of two authors who at first appear not to have a lot in common. However, when we combine their ideas, I believe they can powerfully explain to us why the unconscious is so important, in particular, in our current age. It is important to note that it is not the aim of this chapter to criticize our modern societies and romanticize those of the past. Our modern societies have provided us with loads of benefits. However, as discussed in this chapter, these benefits have come at some cost. The discussion that follows illustrates why Jung's undertaking can be so extremely valuable to us as individuals, but also to our societies in general, in the sense that they can teach us how we can mitigate some of the costs which exist as a result of the characteristics of our modern societies. The first of the two authors whose ideas I would like to discuss is cultural anthropologists Ernest Baker. According to Ernest Baker, modern humans find themselves in a problematic situation. It can be argued that we can become too smart or that our societies have become too developed to satisfy one of our most important human needs, the need to be a hero. Ernest Baker, in this book, The, de the, the Denial of Death, observed that it is a part of man's tragic destiny, that one must find a way to stand out and prove something to him or himself as well to the rest of the world. Baker argued an individual must desperately justify himself as an object of primary value in the universe. He must stand out, but a hero make a bigger, make the biggest possible contribution to world's life, so that he counts more than anything or anyone else. As a result, Baker argued that an individual must constantly compare him to himself to others in order to prevent lagging behind those around him or in order to make some that he or she will see still matters. An animal who gets his feeling of worth symbolically has to minutely compare himself to those around him to make sure he doesn't come off second best. Such as argument might also help explain why relative wealth, for instance, often considered to be more important than absolute wealth. Heroism. Baker indicated that in this case, everyone wants to be a hero with the purpose of providing oneself with a sufficient feeling of self-worth and providing to the world that he or she counts. However, according to Baker, even though everyone desires to be a hero, nobody openly admits to this desire. Baker observed that the most individuals do not even admit this to themselves and are not consciously aware of this desire. Baker considered this to be surprising because, as Baker observed, the desire to be a hero is ingrained deep into the 
psyche of every individual, Baker believed that such a desire come natural, comes natural to us and has been ingrained deep within us through years of evolution. At the same time, Baker observed that some such a desire is still clearly visible when observing the behaviors of children. According to Baker, in our current age, where we where is a lot less opportunity for traditional heroism, we still try to satisfy this need, albeit it is less obvious ways. Ways in which this is done, according to Baker, include having a more expensive car than one's neighbors, living in bigger houses than one's friends, or having children which go to better universities than one's colleagues. However, even though the methods used for arguing the feeling of being a hero have changed, the motives have remained the same, as observed by Baker, but underneath throbs the ache of cosmic specialness, no matter how we mask it in concerns of a smaller scope. Society as a hero system. According to Baker, each society, despite their differences, still hero system comprises of different classes and certain specific rules and regulations, which define how one should behave in society. Therefore, Baker defined societies as symbolic action systems. Existing of all these differences, classes and status, with their main function being the creation of some sense of heroism, even though many cultures and societies differ in these rules and costumes, they all serve the same purpose. Whether a culture and society is primitive, religious or scientific does not matter. All indicated by Baker, they serve the same purpose. It is still a mythical hero system in which people serve in order to, learn, in order to earn a feeling of primary value, a temple, a cathedral, a totem, pole, skyscrapers, a family that spent three generations. It is thereby the desire to create something of lasting value, thereby creating something which outlasts even death and proves to people that their undertakings have a broader significance. Although every society is set up with the same purpose, they differ to the extent at which they succeed in satisfying the human need for heroism. Baker indicated that the societies which we consider to be primitive were more successful in this regard. Baker questioned whether our current societies can still adequately provide us with meaning that even argued that we are experiencing a crisis of heroism because the, they, younger generations, are not motivated by the structures set up by modern societies. The crisis of modern societies is precisely that the youth no longer feel heroic in the plan for action that their culture has set up. They don't believe it is empirically true, the problem of their lives and times. We are living in a crisis of heroism that reaches into every aspect of our social life. This development can be characteristic by an increase in the rise of political activism, more extreme political viewpoints, the rise of anti-heroes, and the negative view towards traditional religions. Baker concluded his dis discussion on heroism by observing that every society constitutes some form of religion. Such a society itself is a codified hero system which means that societies everywhere is a living myth of significance of human life, a defined creation of meaning. Every society thus is a religion, whether it thinks so or not. Soviet religion and Maoist religion are as truly religious as our scientific and consumer religion. The question that we can now ask ourselves is, what can be done to solve this crisis in our societies? In order to answer this question, it is interesting to first examine how our societies differ from scientists in the past. 
As indicated previously, Baker argued that societies which we today call primitive managed to satisfy our need for heroism in the past much better. If we can identify how these scientists differ in this regard to our present-day societies, we might be able to recognize that we lack in our current societies. Heroism, past and present. How is it possible that societies in the past managed to satisfy this need for heroism inherent in human while our human societies lack this ability? To answer this question, we can turn once again to Joseph Campbell, who studied and compared mythologies throughout the world and was influenced by the theories of Jung. As observed in the previous chapter, Campbell was especially interested in the myth of the hero. Campbell argued that myth and mysteries played a key role in satisfying the desire to be a hero in the past. In this book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, Campbell indicated that nature used to be the important source of mystery, which created a sense of purpose and heroism for mankind. For the primitive hunting people of those remotest human millennia where the saber-toothed tiger, the mammoth, and the lesser presences of animal kingdom were the primary ma ma manifestation of what was alien, the source at once of danger and sustenance. The great human problem was to become linked psychologically to the task of sharing the wildernesses with the beings. According to Campbell, this resulted in unconscious identification with these beings which became apparent in the myths and ritual of these communities. Similarly, Campbell indicated that cultural, cultural, cultures supporting themselves on plant food based their ritual around plant instead of animals. As Campbell observed, these rituals resulted in a cohesive society wherein the human ego played a less crucial role since through this ritual and the plant and animal were see seen as guide, which gave symbolic meaning to the existence of man through a collective understanding of the symbolic meaning of these plants and animals. Societies managed to exit, exist as a harmonious unity. However, as a human society continued to progress, the animal and plant worlds started to lose their mystery. As a result, Campbell observed that the human turned their attention to a new area of mystery, the sky, in order to provide them with symbolic meanings. Both the plant and the animal world, however, were in the end brought under social control, whereupon the, the great field of instructive power shifted to the skies and mankind enacted the great pantomime of the sacred moon king, the sacred sun king, the hierarchic planetary state and the symbolic festivals of the world regulating spheres. In parallel to the animals and plants, the moon and the sun have also lost some of this mystery in our current age, whereby they have also lost their ability to provide our psyche with symbolic meanings, according to Campbell's. Therefore, we can no longer achieve a feelings of heroism by struggling with the great forces of nature. However, as indicated by Baker, we still desire such a struggle. As a result, we try to fulfill this desire by acquiring riches, building a huge skyscrapers, or writing about them in a book, hoping to create something of lasting value. The Role of Science Science can be considered the largest contributor to the end of the importance of myths and religions. Might science therefore provide us with a sense of heroism? In this regard, author and philosopher Albert Camus made some interesting remarks in his book The Myths of Sisyphus. Camus observed that science does not increase our connection with the world. Instead, it might even result in ever-increasing separation from our world. Camus believed that this was the case because all scientist knowledge combined merely results in fact and laws with 
which are too complicated for the psyche to grasp. In this way, they do not provide any symbolic meaning, which would be necessary to connect our psyche to nature. At the final stage, you teach me that this wondrous and multicolored universe can be produced, can be reduced to the atom, and that the atom itself can be reduced to the electrons. All this is good, and I wait for you to continue, but you tell me of an invisible planetary system in which electrons gravitate around a nucleus. You explain the world to me in an image. I realize then that you have been reduced to poetry. In this case, the more you know, the more you will lose touch with the world, and the less we can use the world as an inspiration. Science explains the world in an image, in an image, an image which we opposed to the image created by myths cannot grasp it does not hold any symbolic value as a result science cannot replace the role myths had scientists cannot provide us with a sense of heroism because of this lack of symbolic value lost connection with the world i believe that the major differences between our current societies and the primitive societies in the past can be found in this connection with nature and the world in general. In the past, our connection with the world and the myths and mystery, mysteries, which were a result of living so intimately with nature, formed an important source of erosion. In the primitive scientist, in the primitive societies, people were connected with the world and nature in modern societies. This is no longer the case. Nature has lost more, more of its mystery. Most of us can live without any knowledge of nature and a deep connection with nature is no longer required. At the same time, as we have seen, science is not a contender of the increasing our connection with the world. Instead, it can be argued that it will only remove us further away from a connection with the world. As already indicated as important source of a deeper connection with the external and internal world for ancient societies were myths. In another, in another book, The Inner Reaches of Outer Space, Joseph Campbell described myths as production of human imagination, their images consequently, though derived from the material world and its supposed history, are like dreams, revelations of the deepest hope, desire and fears, potentialities and conflicts of the human will, which in turn is moved by the energies of the organs of the body operating variously against each other and in concert. Every myth, that is to say, whether or not by intention, is psychologically symbolic. Its narratives and images are to be read, therefore not literally, but as metaphors. Myths can thereby explain our role and our purpose on earth and provide us with the sense of meaning. At the same time, they can be an important source of heroism because myths result in a sense of value in the universe. The question that, Allah, that follows is, that we can do to remain our sense of heroism in a world without myths and mysteries. According to Campbell, we cannot simply go back to our old ways. Instead, we must find a new ways, since everything that has been achieved through modern societies' developments cannot simply be made undone. Instead, Campbell proposed to turn elsewhere for spiritual significance. Campbell observed that the field of knowledge has shifted and that internal world is now left in the dark. As a result, Campbell believed that the hero of our age is he or she who can bring light to the darkness of the soul. The hero, the hero did to be wrought in is not today what it was in the century of Galileo. Where then there was darkness, now there is light, but also where light was, there now is darkness. The modern hero did most that of questioning to bring to light again the lost 
Atlantic of the Coordinated Soul. Myths and the Truth According to Campbell, it is easy to level myths and mysteries as lies. However, myths are based on a different kind of truth. As argued by Campbell, a truth which can only be understood by the soul. By rational labeling them as lies, we deprived we deprive the soul and the world in its entirety. From another level of meaning, a meaning which is of equal importance to our existence. Campbell believed that such meaning which provides nourishment to the soul is important as a counterpart to our professional interests in meaning provided by material objects, such as the development of our species through the creation of inner increasing amount of health. Although myths and mysteries are therefore today quickly disposed of as false, Campbell argued that every individual still carries the potential of comprehend these myth mythological images. As a result, Campbell indicated that we should find a way to satisfy our desire for such image. In this sense, Campbell was influenced by Jung's idea of collective uh, unconscious and the archetypes. Campbell argued that the archetypes can be related to myths and that, that these mythical images are therefore also present within the unconscious of every individual. Campbell argued that the unconscious is comprised of all sorts of such mysterious forces, forces which can rise up to the conscious mind through various mechanisms. The unconscious sends all sorts of vapors, odd beings, terrors, and deluding, deluding images up into the mind, whether in dreams, broad daylight, or in insanity for the human kingdom, beneath the floor of the comparatively neat little dwelling that we call our consciousness goes down into unsuspected Aladdin cave. Campbell observed that this unconscious force can be extremely dangerous in the sense that they can appear suddenly because of a certain smell, the sight of some object, or the look of passerby on the street. These events might touch, according to Campbell, a magic spring, and then dangerous messages, message, messengers being to appear in the brain. These unconscious force can then suddenly threaten the apparent secure world of conscious mind. However, according to Campbell, they can be of major importance to us as well because they, uh, they, open, they open our minds to the mysterious world and thereby the contents hidden deep within ourselves. As a result, Campbell believed that these images presented by the unconscious provide the key to the discovery of the true self. As a result, they might lead to the destruction of our secure world in which we are consciously residing. They might then, however, be used to completely recreate our world more fully because our world will be based upon something which transcends our role in society. Destruction of our, of our world that we have built and in which we live and of ourselves within it, put them wonderful reconstruction of the older, cleaner, more spacious, spacious and fully human life. That is the lure, the promise and terror of this disturbing might, visitants from the mythological realm that we carry within. It is up to us to decide whether we pay attention to this other realm or not. However, if we do so, according to Joseph Campbell, an entirely different reality and presented to the individual. If the witness is prepared, there ensure a transfer of self-identification from the temporal reflecting body to the sun-like eternal source and one then knows oneself as a consubstantial with what is of no time or place but universal and beyond death, yet incarnate in all being, everywhere and forever, so that was we again may read in the Upanishad, Tatsamasi, Thou art that. 
thereby something of everlasting value will have been created and the desire described by Baker will have been achieved, albeit in the different way, in a way that is a lot more alike to the way of our ancient ancestors. The key to the mystic realm. Such an occurrence to the described such an occurrence as described by Campbell is one of the positive effect which can result from attention being paid to the connection between the conscious and unconscious. Jung, however, often times focused more on the negative consequence which might arise when one does not to pay enough attention to this connection. Jung observed that multiple issues could arise within an individual resulting from a split between one's conscious and unconscious world. Jung even observed that such a split, if it is widely spread among the population, can result in massive hysteria. Jung considered this to be the case because rationally, without being balanced by symbolic images and other beliefs, cannot prevent the mind from the lure of dangerous idea and ideologies. The ever-widening split between the conscious and unconscious increases the danger of psychic infection and mass psychosis. With the loss of symbolic idea, the bridge to the unconscious is broken down. Instinct no longer affords protection against unsound ideas and empty slogans. Rationality, because tradition and without a basis in instinct, is proof against no absurdity. This would also help explain many political developments which have occurred in 20th century as well. Campbell, however, focused more on the positive consequences of more attention being paid to the unconscious, most notably in the sense that it is a key to the mystic realm. Simultaneously to Jung, Campbell saw symbolic ideas such as myths as a bridge between the conscious and unconscious realm. Furthermore, as argued by Campbell, the mystic realm is as much a part of the world as the worldly realm with which we can so familiar. Campbell argued that the two worlds essentially forms, forms one single unit and that it is the main task of the hero. To explore the connection between the two worlds and unite the forgotten world of the god, with our worldly realm. This exploration is heroic because in this order, in these other dimensions, once secure conscious world will be completely deconstructed and all the undertakings which appear to be of so much importance in the conscious world will appear meaningless. The values and the, and the distinctions that is normal life seems important, disappears with the terrifying assimilation of the self into that formerly was only otherness. However, the hero who manages to transcend the conscious realm faces a problem similar to the problem described by Plato in the allegory of cave whereby Plato observed that an individual who has seen the truth will not be taken seriously by the blind masses. Therefore, even though Campbell argued that the hero upon, in, upon his return should share his discoveries with the rest of the world, Campbell indicated that it might be impossible to define these discoveries in usual worldly terms. How translate into terms of yes and no revelation that satter into meaninglessness every attempt to define the pairs of opposite? How communicate to people who insist on the executive evidence of their senses the ma message of all generating void? As we have seen already, young uh, struggled with this challenge as well and it took him a long time to find the right translation for the discoveries he made. The discovery of the other realm. Campbell argued that all the true religion practices are directed and discoveries of these other mystic realms. Campbell discovered that they do so in almost identical way whereby a short of desolation 
dissolution of the ego is a common characteristic. The individual, through prolonged psychological disciplines, give no, gives up completely all attachment to his personal limitations, idiosyncrasies, hopes and fears, no longer assists the self-annihilation that is prerequisite to rebirth in the real, realization of truth and so become ripe. At least for the great at one, pan, at one moment, his personal ambition being totally dissolved, he no longer tries to live, but willingly relaxes to whatever may come to pass in him. He becomes, that is to say, an anonymity. The law give the law lives in him with his unreserved consent. This is something which becomes increasingly more difficult as we continue to develop our societies further. Instead of being more of a part of this world or consciously living within this world, we are living increasingly outside of it. Campbell argued that today the conscious individual is the focal point of all meanings. In the past, all meaning was in a group of people or in the world whereby myths function as coordinating principles. This shift of meaning is therefore problematic, according to Campbell, because within the individual, this meaning is largely unconscious. In relation to the discussion of Jung's idea of archetypes in chapter 4, this indicates a shift from collective archetypes to personal archetypes, whereby their meaning has become harder to discern. Moreover, as a result of this development, Campbell observed that the, uh, the forces which were previously known to be compelling the world forward are now unknown precisely because they shift from collective archetypes into personal archetype. Therefore, Campbell argued that there is no longer any clear connection between the conscious and unconscious. The line of communication between the conscious and unconscious Jones of the human psyche have all been cut and we have been split in two. Traditional myths have been replaced by state religion, patriotism and work life. According to Campbell, it is necessary to reintroduce myths in such a mythless society. Such a monkey holiness is not what functioning world requires, rather a transmutation of the whole society. Other is necessary so that through even detail and act of uh, secular life, the vitalization image of universe God man who is actually imminent of effective in all of us may be somehow made known to the consciousness. Campbell believed that such a new myth can be found within the in individual, whereas previously the animal kingdom and therefore the cosmos were source of mystery. The individual can now fulfill this role. Not the animal world, not the plant world, the miracle of the sphere, but man himself is now the crucial mystery. Man is that alien presence with whom the forces of egoism must come to terms, the, through whom the ego is to be crucified and resurrected, and in whose image society is to be reformed. A new myth, the true crucial mystery. In conclusion, Joseph Campbell observed that the myth served a vital role in the past as a bridge of unconscious. Although myths are not true in the usual way in which the term is used, they are true in a separate way. They can have an important function as a metaphor thereby illustration a much deeper truth compared to what we also what we are able to comprehend at first we do however no longer believe in myths because for us to believe in something it has to be scientifically true as a result of this development we have lost an important bridge to our unconscious however as observed by Campbell and Young, a split between conscious and unconscious can have some profound consequences. Sadly, no replacement has been found for the role that myths used to play in this regard. As Campbell indicated, religion, patriotism or consumer consumerism are not capable of filling this void. Campbell argued that we 
must look inward to fill this gap. Our own presence in this world is the greatest mystery at this point. It is up to the modern modern hero to solve this mystery uh, and present his or her discoveries to the world, thereby providing symbolic meaning to society. It is not society that is to guide and save the creative hero, but precisely the reverse. And so every one of us shares the supreme ordeal, carries the cross of the Redeemer, not in the bright moments of his tribe's great victories, but in the silence of his personal despair. As observed by Campbell, we must look for new coordinated myth which can increase our connection with the world. This image should, as indicated by Campbell, not be based on the narrow-minded ideals of the single nation or culture, but instead on something which connects all of mankind. Campbell argued that momentary systems built around countries, social statuses or race, for instance, are no match to the lasting celestial images which constitute the life within us all. Furthermore, although the image might be the same of all, same for all of mankind, the symbols representing the image might differ depending on local circumstances and cultures. Therefore, it is necessary for men to understand and be able to see that through various symbols and same redemption is revealed. The way to become human is to recognize the lineament of God in all of the wonderful modulations of the face of man. From the ideas put forward by Ernest Baker and Joseph Campbell, we can conclude that humans need myth and mysteries in order to provide us with a sense of meaning and significance, a sense of heroism. The more our societies have developed, the less we are able to receive this feeling of importance from traditional myths and mysteries. The world has lost most of its mystery. As a result, our society is experiencing a crisis, as indicated by Baker. This is the case because the younger generations do not see the course of action set up by present-day sci scientists societies as heroic. They do not motivate them to action. As we have seen from this discussion, Campbell proposed to derive a new universal image or myth from true crucial mystery, which still exists. Man himself, Campbell, observed that it is up to man to create such a new image, this time not in moments of great victory, but in the silences of personal despair. The importance of our unconscious, chaos and order. The crucial mystery of a man is not to be found in the conscious mind. It is not more consciousness that will save the creative hero and thereby society in general. Instead, the true creative hero will be he or she who enters and explores the depths of unconscious and then return with newfound knowledge, knowledge relating not to just not just to his own person but to all other individuals as well. Only in this way the lost Atlantis of the coordinated soul can be brought to light. It can be argued that our conscious mind represents order and our unconscious mind chaos. If we ignore our unconscious mind, thereby ignoring chaos, we can become too one-sided according to Jung. It is in fact one of the most important tasks of psychic hygiene to pay continual attention to the symptomatology of unconscious contents the processes for the good reasons that the conscious mind is always in danger of becoming one-sided of keeping two well-worn paths and getting stuck in blind alley. In the Red Book, Jung argued that chaos is just, an important, just as important as order and both are necessary in order to find true meaning. True meaning, Jung argued, is found by uniting chaos and order, thereby producting divine child. The ever-increasing importance of unconscious 
In this sense, Jung argued that the unconscious represented by chaos has an important compensation function. The more the unconscious forces are suppressed, the less they can succeed in playing this compensatory role. Jung observed that the more complicated our lives become, the less we pay attention to our unconscious. However, it is precisely at this moment that our unconscious grows in, grows in importance. Jung observed that through an ever more conscious population, the quiet voice of nature is entirely drowned. Our societies play an important role in quieting this voice of nature and thereby neglecting the importance of our unconscious. Henry David Thoreau is, in his book Walden, for example, argued that we attach too much value on our possessions and our roles in society, i.e. our conscious behaviors. Thoreau argued that instead of us using in command of our material poses, positions, they have some, they have come to be in command of us. Men have become the tools of their tools, and men who independently plucked his fruits when he was hungry is become a farmer, and he who stood under a tree for shelter a housekeeper, who now no longer camp as, as for a night, but have settled down on earth and forgotten heaven. Jung also observed that instead of the quiet voice of nature being ever present in our lives, it is drowned by our societies with an overemphasis on conscious thoughts and beliefs, opinions, beliefs, theories, and collective tendencies appear in its state and back up all the ab uh, aberrations of the conscious mind. As our societies continue to develop, these tendencies appear to become stronger as well, making the role of an unconscious as a compensating factor increasingly more important as well. Accepting the reality of evil Moreover, Jung believed that we should not merely accept the positive notion of unconscious, but also the more negative aspects of the unconscious. It is important, according to Jung, because by paying attention to them, we can also negate the evil forces lurking within the unconscious. This is the case because we mentioned previously, the less we leave our unconscious in the dark, the less it will be able to control us. Today, as never forget, it is important that human beings should not overlook and danger of the evil lurking within them. It is unfortunately one too real, only too real, which is only psychology must insist on the reality of evil and must reject any definition that regards it as insignificant or actually non-existent. According to Jung, the unconscious does not differentiate between good and evil and is not even able to make such differentiation. It does not know what is good and what is evil in the unconscious world. This is the case because good and evil, as, as Frederick Nietzsche argued as well, socially constructed. Jung observed that thereby nobody can decide for the entire population what is truly good or evil. No one could possibly say what the general good might, what the general good might be. As a result, it is up to the conscious mind of the individual who decides what is good and what is evil to him or himself. If the individual has integrated the unconscious forces to a considerable degree, it will be able to make conscious decision to make as to which of these unconscious forces are good and which are evil. It is, according to Jung, paramount to pay attention to both. The importance of unconscious for the world in general. Besides the unconscious being important for the psychic health of the individual, as we have seen, Joseph Campbell attached an importance to an individual's exploration of the unconscious which transcends the individual. The lost Atlantic 
Atlantis of the coordinated soul has to be found by the individual, but it will benefit the entire society by exploring the crucial mystery. Man himself, according to Campbell, likewise Jung implied that the exploration of the unconscious is not only important to the individual, as individual is the introduction. Jung argued that the conflict arising within the individual through an unconscious mind that is not brought to light will be projected upon the world and therefore impact the world in its entirety. As indicated, Jung even argued that if a group of individuals or an entire society or perhaps even the entire world lose touch with unconscious world, mass hysteria can be the outcome. This is the case, according to Jung, because in the past, symbols such as myths have mysteries functioned as an important link between the conscious and unconscious world. As Campbell observed as well, these symbols are slowly eroding as a result of this lack of connection between the conscious and unconscious. Mass hysteria becomes possible. According to Jung, because these symbols no longer protect the mind against dangerous ideas. An ever-increasing breakdown of tradition plays a role in this development as well, according to Jung. Loss of roots and lack of tradition neuroticized the masses and prepared them to collective hysteria. Jung believed that the materialism only further fueled this development and that, in response to this mass hysteria, liberties are slowly abolished. Collective hysteria calls for collective therapy, which consists in abolition of liberty and terror terrorization, where the rationalistic materialism holds away. States tend to develop less into prison than into lunatic asylum. Conclusion The Importance of Unconscious Jung argued that every individual can make his or her own choice in accordance with the need of becoming aware of one's unconscious mind. If the voluntary, ta voluntary takes the burden of the com completeness on himself, he need not find it happening to him against his will in a negative form. According to Jung, if an individual does not recognize the importance of an unconscious voluntary Voluntarily, this have been some serious negative consequences, not only for the individual, but for the entire world. Moreover, we, as we have seen from the argument presented by Ernest Baker and Joseph Campbell, the exploration of the unconscious is not solely important in order to prevent certain negative effects which might arise from the neglected unconscious from occurring instead the unconscious might also be source of a new myth as sonu samdasani indicated in the introduction introductory volume of the black book black books jung found the source of this new myth in the soul whereas Jarathrustha proclaimed the death of God. River Novus, the Red Book, depicts the rebirth of the God in the soul. Now that we understand why the unconscious is, no, is so important and why Jung considered it of such a significance that he decided to, to dedicate his life its, to its exploration, it is understandable why Jung's mission is also of interest to those who are not studying psychology, instead paying attention to the unconscious is the importance of important part of psychic hygiene. In the following chapter, it is discussed how Jung suggested one can assimilate these unconscious forces. As discussed in chapter 3, Jung called this process individuation. Through this process, the ego and the self can be al al aligned thereby making unconscious process conscious. Throughout the black books and the red book, Jung documented his own individuation process as a result. Throughout the following chapter, this book 
begins to in incorporate more of the content of Jung's initial works as proposed to Jung's later works, wherein his theories are more developed by studying the Jung's processes in more detail from its original sources. We can also learn how the individuation process might be approached by those interested. At the same time, it is not necessary to undertake such a process oneself by analyzing Jung's process. We already learn a lot about the unconscious forces in general.